what does it mean to charter a museum? In New York State, educational corporations are created by the Board of Regents of the University of the State of New York. And the Board of Regents oversees New York State's educational system, um, and therefore they oversee nonprofit organizations and institutions with educational purposes. Um, and those institutions with said educational purposes seeking to incorporate must do so under the education department as opposed to the traditional Department of State method of incorporation. This all falls under education law section 216 um, and this subjects those organizations to the authority of the regents. And New York State is rather unique in this regard. Um, other states tend to view cultural organizations like museums or libraries or archives as nonprofit businesses, not educational organizations. In New York State, there are approximately 1,800 museums, historical societies, and cultural agencies chartered. Um, this is a, a general number, um, not, not exact, because um, there are always new organizations being chartered. There are two different types of incorporation overseen by the regents. You are charters and regent certificates of incorporation, which um, we'll just refer to as certificates of incorporation for the sake of um, simplicity. The former charters are granted to museums or historical societies that own collections or intend to own collections, while the, the latter is granted to cultural agencies that don't own collections and do not intend to own collections at all. Uh, charters are further divided into two separate categories, provisional charters and absolute charters, and we'll discuss the differences between these two later on. So before we go into further detail, just a couple definitions that I think might be beneficial to go over. Um, the first is, what is a museum? Uh, the definition uh, adopted by the Board of Regents and the Regents rules, which oversees all museums in the state, has a, has a specific definition, which includes more types of organizations than one might think. So according to the Regents rules, a museum is an organized non-for-profit institution, including but not limited to halls of fame, zoos, aquariums, botanical gardens, and arboretums. They are essentially educational or aesthetic in purpose with professional staff, which ordinarily owns, exhibits, maintains, and or utilizes artifacts, art, and or specimens. This includes non-tangible electronic, video, digital, and similar art. The institution cares for them and exhibits them to the public on some regular schedule. So um, there are some differences between what is considered a museum and what might be considered a historical society. A historical society does have a slightly different definition. Um, still an organized non-for-profit institution, but with their purposes limited to a reasonable and clearly defined geographical area or one or more specific subjects of interest. They gather, preserve, advance, or dis disseminate knowledge about the past through research, collections, acquisition, and management, preservation and or interpretation, which carries an educational um, or uh, public programs on a regular schedule. These programs and resources are made accessible to the public and the institution is appropriately and professionally staffed by paid or volunteer personnel who possess the sufficient training and knowledge to meet the requirements of its stated mission and the needs of its collections. There is also um, in existence historical societies without collections, which essentially follows the same guideline, but without the collection ownership, unless it's for a, a temporary period of time on loan from another institution for the use of research or a temporary um, exhibit. And then a cultural agency um, is an organized not-for-profit corporation that is not a museum or historical society organized for the promotion of sciences, literature, art, history, or some other department of knowledge or education in any way. This might include a friends group organized specifically to serve and support museums, historical societies, or state, federal, or local historic sites. 
with the intention to serve and support any similar corporation chartered or incorporated by the regions. Um, this type of institution, however, is not authorized to own or hold collections except to borrow items owned by others for brief periods of time for purposes of study or short term temporary exhibitions, such as historical societies without collections. They share that characteristic. So what are the benefits of chartering? The most important advantage, the initial advantage really, is that when you become a chartered entity, you become a legal entity, you are incorporated. Um, chartered organizations are also eligible to apply as a nonprofit tax exempt education corporation under um, section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue, Revenue Code meaning that admission charges or donations to your chartered organization aren't considered taxable income, which in turn encourages more donations. To be eligible for certain grant programs as well, proof of incorporation is required and having a charter is a valid form of incorporation. Education collections with education corporations, I apologize, with collections also have collection specific language within their charters um, and the documentation that they are required to submit to our office that aren't found in traditional methods of incorporation. And really one of our, our big goals is to make sure that collections are protected in the public interest. So on to the charters themselves. Our most valuable resource for chartering information is our office's website, which is through the New York State Museum website. Within this website, we have a brief summary of chartering, the steps for individual chartering actions, sample documents that we require within charter applications, as well as additional outside resources for chartered entities. Contact information for document requests, annual report submissions, and relevant sections of laws are also listed within this site. And we've divided this, we've divided the chartering process to distinguish between the certificates of incorporation and charters, as you can see in the screenshot here with the separate tabs. So we'll start with provisional charters. Charters are meant for institutions with collections. I know it's a little repetitive, but that is our biggest distinguishing factor when it comes to being chartered or obtaining a certificate of incorporation. So when a museum or a historical society with collections or with the intention to own collections wishes, wishes to charter, they should apply for a provisional charter. Provisional charters are valid for a term of five years, after which the charter must be extended or an application for an absolute charter may be submitted, but we'll be going over absolute charters a little while later. To apply for a provisional charter, a board of trustees must be formed. Um, one important characteristic of this board is only one third of the board can be related through birth or marriage. Um, so this newly formed board must submit a petition for a provisional charter to the Board of Regents. This document must be signed and notarized by board members and sent to the State Education Department with the following documentation attached. A cultural agency questionnaire, questionnaire which is provided on our website the bylaws and or the constitution that governs the organization, a full list of your trustees, a minimum of five trustees to a maximum of 25, a code of ethics, an emergency disaster plan, a list of all your board committees, a list of positions, hours per week of employees and salaries if this is applicable, the resumes of professional staff again if applicable, and a copy of your IRS tax exempt level, if applicable. For many organizations, this is a step that's um, pursued after gaining the charter. So this isn't a required document, but if you happen to already have tax exempt status, then we would like to have that letter as part of your application. We also ask for a copy of your budget or a list of potential expenditures or a proposed budget, um, depending on your state of existence at the time of the application. And the last item we require 
is a collections management policy. And this policy must cover the acquisition, the loan, preservation, public access, and deaccessioning of your collection with specific language regarding um, deaccession and collection protection. Samples of all of these documents are provided on our website. Um, we have everything split up by the type of charter action, um, then a step-by-step -step process, and then sample documents. These sample documents can be adopted by your organization. Um, things can be added, but generally everything that's in there, we would like to have in your final um, application submission. Once the documents have all been completed, the final act application itself can be compiled. The, the petition has to be sent in triplicate, the original petition plus two copies, and then one copy of all the supporting documentation that I just listed. This is mailed to the State Education Office of Council for an initial review. Once they've gone through it, the application is sent to my office, and if there's anything missing within the application or something has to be re revised or something has to be added, I will reach out and work with you to complete whatever it is that's missing. So if, for instance, um, you neglected to have a loan section in your collections policy, I would reach out to you. We would figure out how to put that loan section in there and we'd add it to your application. There, there wouldn't, you wouldn't have to resubmit your entire application because something is missing. So once that's complete and my review is complete, uh, I will write a recommendation and send it back to the Office of Council for one final review. And then the application will be added to a waiting list to be put on a Regents meeting agenda. This is generally the longest period of time throughout this whole application process. Uh, the time spent on this waiting list, um, as I would refer to it, can be four to six weeks, depending on um, when the recommendation is sent in and when the regions are meeting next. They generally meet once a month. So once it's on that agenda and you're in a regents meeting and you've been voted on during a regents meeting, then you'll be notified by the Office of Council that the application was voted on and you'll be sent your official charter document six to eight weeks later. It's a long process, but it's worth it, I promise. Um, and the provisional charter's five-year lifespan begins on the date that it's voted on by the regents. So it, the five years doesn't start when the application is submitted, the five years starts when the charter is granted. So next, a uh, regent certificate of incorporation. This application process is fairly similar to the application process for a provisional charter. A board of trustees must be formed and submit a petition to the Board of Regents. But the biggest difference here for the, a Regent Certificate of Incorporation is the supplemental documentation that's required. This application process doesn't require an emergency disaster plan and doesn't require a collections management policy, primarily because these organizations are not meant to own collections. Um, institutions that apply for a region certificate of incorporation might include a friends group for a museum, historical society, historic site, or even preservation groups. The petition and the supporting documents follow the same path as the charter application, reviewed first by the Office of Council, then reviewed by my office, and then returned to the Office of Council with a recommendation placed on a region's agenda and voted on. Regent certificates of incorporation don't have that five-year term limit. They're a permanent form of incorporation and don't require renewal. So now you've been incorporated. You have your initial charter document or initial certificate of incorporation. What are your next steps? What are your post-incorporation responsibilities? There are a couple. Um, there are some requirements and there are some actions that we recommend you take once you've been incorporated. So under the Education Law Section 215 and the Regents Rules, every chartered organization is required to submit an annual report. This report can be accessed via our website and submitted online. It's a, a rather brief, easy form to fill in. 
Um, a reminder to submit this report generally goes out in the spring. Lately, this has been interrupted due to the COVID situation. There was a delay last year. There's a slight delay this year. The reminder hasn't gone out yet, but it will go out soon. The report asks for attendance numbers. If you had any K through 12 attendees to your site, um, what your budget was for the year, if you had any collection decessions, um, and keeping these reports, they, they remain in our records and submitting them, them keeps you in good standing with the education department. Um, post incorporation, you should also apply for that 501c3 status as we discussed earlier. And you should also file as an exempt corporation within the New York State Attorney General's Charities Bureau. As an educational corporation who submits reports to the education department, you're exempt from submitting reports to the Charities Bureau. Um, this is, being an education corporation is a New York specific practice, so it can lead to some misunderstandings within a larger corporate world, for example. Um, some issues that some organizations have, um, when they go to open a bank account, they're required to provide proof of incorporation or um, organizations look to see if you have an entry within the Department of State Corporation business entity database. Uh, your charter or your certificate of incorporation is your incorporation document that is proof of incorporation. It's very, it's essentially the legal equivalent of a certificate of incorporation from the Department of State. Um, but having your institution on a public facing database like the Charities Bureau, even as an exempt corporation can alleviate some of this charter related confusion. All right. So we've gone through initial incorporation. We've gone through the types of charters to start that incorporation and what your immediate post incorporation requirements are. So next, we'll go on to those other charter actions. Um, the first of which being charter amendments. At any time during your charter's lifetime, um, you can petition the regents to amend your charter. The um, charter or the certificate of incorporation, the regent certificate of incorporation can be amended. Possible reasons to amend a charter or certificate of incorporation include changing the corporate name, the corporate purposes, perhaps your entity has moved and you have to change your corporate address. Um, maybe you have added a couple of trustees and you need to alter the number of trustees within your charter. To amend a charter, you have to submit a petition and a board resolution to the regents. And this petition resolution must be signed and notarized following instructions that are, again, posted on our website. Then the originals and two copies of both documents should be sent to the Office of Counsel for their initial review, then my review, and then back to them again to be voted on by the regents. Um, and the specific amendments should be outlined within your petition. If you're changing your address, you should say explicitly in the petition, we are amending our address to be XYZ. Next, we have extending the provisional charter. So as you know, a provisional charter has a term of five years. And at the end of that term, a museum or educational corporation may choose to apply for an absolute charter if they fulfill the requirements to do so. If not, the museum or educational corporation may apply to extend their existing provisional charter for an additional five years. To extend a provisional charter, the board of the chartered entity must submit a petition to the Board of Regents signed and notarized and sent in with a board resolution signed by the board secretary. Um, again, originals and two copies of both of these documents go to the Office of Counsel goes through the same review process that we've already discussed. Um, office of Council, my office, back to Office of Council, waiting list on an agenda. As well, something else to add, um, you can extend and amend your charter at the same time. This can be done as one charter action. There's a special petition to do so. Um, 
it saves time, it saves money to do it at the same time if you need to amend your name or your address or your purposes. And steps for this process can be found under our website under the extending the provisional charter steps. We've kind of grouped them into one, one area. So our final type of charter is the absolute charter. And anyone that has a provisional charter should be aiming to reach the qualifications um, that would make you uh, qualified for an absolute charter. So the absolute charter is a form of permanent incorporation. It doesn't require extension every five years, but we do advise that before applying chartered organizations review the Museum Association of New York's standards and best practices document. It's included at the beginning of our absolute charter section of our website. Um, to receive an absolute charter, an organization does have to meet additional qualifications within uh, personnel, finance, facilities, collections, exhibitions, and programming. And these are all outlined within this document that Manny created. Um, so the absolute charter application is a, a more, I don't wanna say complicated, but an, an involved process. There are a lot more um, goals that you have to meet in order to get this type of incorporation. So again, you need to submit a petition and a board resolution. You need a code of ethics, but this code of ethics as opposed to the provisional charter application must also include a conflict of interest policy as well as a whistleblower policy. You need to have that emergency disaster plan, a list of all board committees, um, with a require an additional requirement to have a finance and a collection committee. Um, list of positions, hours per week, salaries of employees, if applicable, resumes of professional staff members, again, if applicable, a copy of your IRS tax exempt letter, your current budget, and again, a copy of your collections management policy, which just as last time, has to cover acquisition, loan, preservation, access, and deaccessioning of collections. This complete application is sent to the Office of Counsel, then sent to my office. If the application is complete and everything that needs to be there is there, then I will reach out to your organization to arrange a site visit. This is another unique step to the absolute charter process. Before you can be granted this absolute charter, the museum chartering program must perform a site visit to the applying entity to view its building, um, its exhibits, its collection storage, and make sure everything is as it should be. Currently, site visits are being performed virtually due to COVID-19. Um, we're looking forward to the day that they can be done in person again, but site visits are still going on. So just because um, travel is restricted, um, these absolute charter petitions are still going through. So once the site visit is completed, uh, my recommendation will be sent to the Office of Council and then you'll be put on the region's agenda. And it's the same process from there that we've already discussed. Oh, charter certificate. Um, so what if you have been incorporated, you have a provisional charter because you had a collection, that was your intent going in. Well, maybe you've decided that you don't want to have that collection anymore. You want to change your purposes slightly. You're giving your collection to another museum. You're changing your incorporation type or you want to change your incorporation type. That is possible. That is another charter action that we can um, go through an application process to do. So if you have a charter and you want to change that to a certificate of incorporation, that's possible. If you have a certificate of incorporation and now you think, you know what, I do want to collect. Our organization does want to have a collection. That can be done as well. And that is not a step that we have explicitly uh, posted on our website, but if that's something that you're interested in, you can reach out to my office and I can give you the required documentation to do that. All right, so now on to just some miscellaneous information. 
There are several sections of laws, as well as the regents rules that govern the chartering process and chartered organization organizations. I've listed several here. Um, these are the, the ones that come up most often. Um, there are others. We have a lot of links on our website and the Regents website as well as a valuable source um, for information and uh, the legal aspects of this whole process. So education, Law 216, that's what gives the Board of Regents the authority to charter. Um, education Law Section 233AA deals with museum property. Education Law 226 um, outlines the Board of Trustees that you won't have less than five, you shouldn't have more than 25. Regents Rules Sections 3.2 to 3.27 and 3.30, those govern the purposes, the creation, the regulation, um, as well as the dissolution of education corporations. And this is the section of governing policy that we refer to the most. 3.27 really outlines the requirements of what a chartered organization should have and should be. And then education law section 215, as well as two parts of the region's rules, require the annual report from chartered entities. One of the things that my office gets the most requests for are copies of charters. Um, maybe it's been decades since you were granted your charter and it's it's been lost over time. Um, maybe you need a copy of your charter because you're applying for that bank account for your organization. My office, unfortunately, does not keep copies of charter documents, but we're very closely associated with two offices that do. So this is the contact information for those two offices. You can contact either one, the New York State Archives or the New York State Board of Regents um, by phone or email, whatever works for you. And it's it'll make the process go a little smoother if you have the full legal name of your organization, as well as the date that the charter you're looking to get a copy of was granted. That is information that my office has. So if that's something that you're looking to do, but you're not sure of the exact date, you can reach out to me and I'll be able to look that up for you. Okay. And that really concludes the informational presentation part of this webinar. Um, so I believe that we should have time for questions if you have any collection, uh, any questions, sorry. Um, and we do have another webinar scheduled for May 20th. Um, if any of you are interested about merging, consolidating, and dissolution. So if you have any questions regarding that, um, maybe keep them until then or reach out to me privately. Uh, but if you have any questions about the content that we have presented, please feel free. So should I just go through the chat here? may have missed yearly reporting submission for 2019. What do I need to do to take care of that? If you would just send me an email, I have my contact information up here, charters at nyse.gov. Um, let me know, reach out, give me the name of your organization and I can search through our records and see if you're missing any annual reports or if you're late on any annual reports. And I'll send you the link to submit it online as well as your group ID number. Um, annual reports do require a separate ID number. It's a three or four digit code um, number that we just use internally. It's not on your charter. Um, so it's easily lost. It's a very common question that I get. What is our group ID number? Um, so reach out to me about any concerns about missing annual reports, and I'll send you what I'm missing, and I'll send you the group ID number to make that submission super easy. Okay. Um, will you send out notice of the delayed report? And also due to COVID-19, will the question be changed regarding K-12 through visitation? as it hasn't been physical, but virtual. Um, when I send out the annual report reminder, I will address the fact that it's delayed. Um, and uh, the fact that it's delayed 
if your annual report is delayed due to that original delay, there's no um, punishment for you. It's absolutely fine. We'll still accept those reports. Um, it is a, a crazy time that we're in currently, and we recognize that, and it's very tough for museums and cultural organizations right now. So if those are a little tardy, that's completely okay with us. And will the question be changed regarding K through 12 visitation? That question will still be on there. Um, there is an, a note section within that report for comments or major changes. I expect that most reports will um, discuss major changes due to COVID and that's fine. Um, if you had maybe virtual programming with schools, feel free to add that attendance in there. If not, we understand attendance is, is strange this, this past reporting year. That's absolutely fine with us. Okay. We have a historical society absolute charter. One provision is we cannot use the word museum. We now have a museum. How or should we amend our charter to include museum? Our society has collections. That might be a little deeper of a question than I can answer right now. Um, again, email me, call me, and we can discuss your specific situation. Um, that might be something better handled um, through a, a, a direct discussion. Okay, and are the annual reports required for a provisional charter? Annual reports are required for any educational entity that is incorporated under the Board of Regents. So if you have a Regents Certificate of Incorporation with my office, if you have a provisional charter, if you have an absolute charter, we do require that annual report. Why do you need a minimum of five trustees? That's actually an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know why that was established as a minimum, but I can see what I find out and I will let you know. Any other questions? I think that's the end of our submitted questions thus far. Give it a couple seconds. Oh, okay, another question in process. I think that is a presentation, presentation society to museum, as a lot of historical societies have decided to change their names. As if that makes a huge difference, why is that? Is this a question of why would you decide to change your name from a museum to a historical society? Um, I guess the, the ideas of museums versus historical societies, they're, are differences. Um, historical societies tend to have a more specific um, concentration in their content, whether that be um, the town that it's in or a field of study. If maybe you're broadening, you might want to call yourself a museum. If you have decided to further concentrate on something, maybe you've decided to call yourself a historical society, that would really be a process of a charter amendment for your name if you're going from say the i'm just gonna make up an example here the albany historical society to the albany museum we'll use an imaginary example that would just be a charter amendment um i think we forgot to send our yearly report for a few years what do we do now again email me i'll tell you what you're missing and um you can send them all in the Online submission goes back to 2018. You can submit, um, that's the earliest year that you can submit for. But if you're missing anything earlier than that, I will send you just a, a Word document with the same questions listed. If you could fill that in and then email it back to me, that will satisfy that requirement. And I'll, I'll, I'll put those annual reports in our files and um, you'll be up to date. Um, Let's see. Oh, I think this goes back to the previous question. Um, what's the process? 
aren't the benefits the same museum is protected language or would a DBA be better? Um, the benefits are generally the same, um, whether you call yourself a historical society or a museum um, and whether you are chartered or have a region certificate of incorporation. Now museum is a protected word. It's a pro pro proprietary word within New York state and you cannot use the term museum unless you're incorporated under the Board of Regents. Um, so if you're incorporated under the Board of Regents, when you're trying to use the word museum, that's fine. Um, if you try to incorporate under the Department of State using a word like museum, um, that application will actually be bounced over to the State Education Department to be reviewed. Um, that's a process called commissioner's consent, but that's a completely separate um, process that I'm not sure we really want to get into now. You can file for a DBA. That's fine too. Um, that's another uh, process and an, another um, action that we can work through between my office and the Office of Counsel. Um, so if you want to make a small change to your name, but you don't want to amend your charter, that's another way to go. All right. So as a chartered organization, so we as a chartered organization can use museum. Generally, yes, yes. Um, when you have an absolute charter, are you automatically incorporated? Well, if you have an absolute charter, you should, should already have a provisional charter, which means you're incorporated. Um, that absolute charter is just another step within that incorporation. Um, so either way you're incorporated. And once you have that charter, you are incorporated. Um, okay, I think, Georgette, did I answer all your questions? I just wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, great. And any other questions? Uh, I see, but that doesn't automatically make you a 501c3. That's correct. When you're incorporated, um, you you have that incorporation document. You are provisionally chartered. You are you have an absolute charter. You have a regent certificate of incorporation. That does not automatically make you a 501c3 organization. That is a separate process that has to be done through the IRS. I believe that has very little to do with my office, except that we recommend you do it. Anything else? Oh, sounds scary. Um, the IRS does have a reputation to be intimidating, um, but I haven't heard any scarring complaints so far, so I think you'll be okay. Any other questions? We've still got a little bit of time, I think. Oh, okay. Yes, more questions? We'll wait on their submission. What about organizations that aren't following the rules? Uh, <laughs> sorry to be a downer. That's okay. Uh, that's fine. We're here to answer whatever questions you have. Um, do you mean rules as in uh, submitting annual reports or do you mean rules as in maybe not um, uh, following name guidelines? What, what particular facet? They allow a charter to expire. Um, so technically a provisional charter does have that five-year time limit. If you end up passing that five years and you've forgotten to renew, we can still renew that charter. You don't have to go all the way back to the process to um, start all over and resubmit an original petition. You don't have to get a new provisional charter. Um, 
Oh, they allow their charter to expire, don't follow up with dissolution, and try to sell off collections. That is a very complicated question. Um, that might be more appropriate for our next webinar um, or a, a private email exchange. What can you do as a community member? I think that's something I'd want to look more into to get a definitive answer for you and not give you bad information. Um, so I apologize for not giving you a, a definitive answer on that one. But thank you for bringing up the question. I'll make note of it and I'll make sure to uh, pursue what information I can give you. Anything else? No, maybe not. Is that the end of our questions? I think so. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, thank you so Lauren, much. for such a, a wonderful presentation. Um, as Lauren mentioned earlier, if you enjoyed today's webinar and would like to learn more about chartering, please join us on May 20th for the second webinar in this series, which will cover mergers, consolidations, and disillusions. So to learn more about this webinar and all of our other upcoming educational programming, please check out dhpsny.org education. Thank you all.